Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning uh, for the Oregon State Board of Agriculture meeting. Today is Monday, April 29th, 2024. Uh, I'm Elon Miller, chair of the board, and this meeting is now officially called to order. Um, I'd like to begin by asking uh, the Department of Agriculture Board Coordinator Carla Van Net Valness to review a few housekeeping items for our meeting. Uh, good morning. We would uh, ask that if you would please mute your phones and computer audio during the call. Um, also, we request board members only and presenters to turn on their camera during the call. And if you're joining by conference call only, pre-meeting materials are available on the ODA website at https colon slash slash uh, ODA dot direct slash board agriculture, or we will be posting additional presentations after the meeting. And just a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. Thank you, Carla. Um, uh, Carla, would you please call on uh, the roll um, for introductions? And I'll begin. Elon Miller, Farmer Umqua. Chad Allen. Barbara Boyer. Barbara Boyer uh, sitting here as the chair of the Soil Water Conservation Commission. Brian Harper is on his way. Miguel Lopez. Miguel Lopez, former Wyant Valley. Eric Oren. Eric Oren, farmer, Hepner. Luisa Santamaria. Luisa Santamaria, <clears throat> public member. Josh Shalinski is not joining us this morning. Uh, Dean Simonich. Stacy Simonich, Dean of Oregon State's College of Agricultural Sciences and Director of the Oregon Agricultural Experiment Station. Uh, Director Sharpelo Hansen. Good morning, Lisa Sharpelo Hansen, Director of the Oregon Department of Agriculture. Uh, for those of you online, if you would please use the chat box to sign in, uh, provide your name and organization so we have a record of who's joining the meeting. Um, and do we have anyone joining by phone only? I don't believe so. Um, again, pre-meeting materials are available on the website at oda.direct slash board agriculture. And that is it. Thank you, Carla. Um, Note that the public comment is scheduled today at 10.45 a.m. Uh, we've received no written public comments uh, ahead of today's meeting. Um, if you would sign up this morning to provide verbal comments, please make a request using the chat box, uh, including your name and organization, or use the sign-in sheet if you're uh, presently here um, at the entry table. Uh, comment time will be limited to three minutes per person. Um, also, again, this meeting is being recorded, and I would ask both board members as well as uh, guests to please state your name for the record before you begin your comments. Um, again, welcome everybody. Um, it's it's great to be here. I, this uh, the Board of Agriculture had a chance to see um, this facility under construction. <laughs> And so it's wonderful that we're going to have a chance to actually see the finished product and uh, and really the coming together of uh, lots of different dreams and visions of people over many years. So I think that's going to be fun that we'll be able to have that time together. Also, um, I would um, mention that just the focus on strategy is is really critical. Obviously, it's something that the governor is requiring, but it's also just something very important for any um, entity agency department to do um, to take a look at charting the course for those priorities that we need to deal with going forward. Um, so I'd like to actually ask uh, Director Hansen to uh, kick off the meeting with her opening remarks. <clears throat> well, good morning and welcome. Um, it's nice to be in person with the board for the first time. So uh, it's great to see all of you and, and get to shake hands. Um, most of you know, I started uh, back uh, early December with the department coming back after two years over at the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. I'm thrilled to be back. Uh, confirmation was early February. I'm into my fifth month, almost sixth month on the job, and it has been a whirlwind is what I'm going to tell you. 
Um, busy time. There's a lot going on in the department. There's been a tremendous amount of change in the agency in the two years that I was gone. And I'm really excited about uh, the conversation that we're going to have today, looking at the strategic plan and talking about charter, charting our course um, for the next couple of years. I think you will hear throughout today and as we move through um, the summer meeting much about rebuilding um, ODA and rebuilding infrastructure um, because we really have a need for that. And so we'll we'll talk through that a lot. So our focus uh, isn't on a lot of new shiny things. It, that's the setup. It's really on core work and core service delivery, customer service, et cetera. Um, those are priorities for the agency. They're priorities for the governor. And um, we're, we're excited about bringing it all together in the strategic plan and look forward uh, to the feedback from all of you. I think you'll notice when Jonathan walks through things, um, we've done modifications to or proposed modifications to our mission statement, to our vision statement, to our core values. Um, there are some fun themes that the staff have worked on, and there has been a great team uh, that has been working on this. And I'll let Jonathan introduce the team when he comes, he comes up. Um, I would just also add, just to give you guys a sense, um, I was on campus at OSU twice last week uh, doing professional development work um, with students. Um, AgFest on Saturday, the week before we were in Hermiston for the Lower Umatilla Groundwater Management Area for um, a town hall meeting with the locals as well as the local advisory committee. I'm trying to think what the week before that was. The last two months, have been on the road and on the meeting tour circuit is what I'll tell you. Um, so it's like I said, whirlwind with a lot going on in a lot of different places, but I'm happy to be home and happy to be with all of you today. Great, thank you, Director Hansen. It's a pleasure to actually all of us be here meeting in person and especially have you here at the helm. Um, I'll, I'll open actually if there's any questions for the director at this time. OK, well, as we lead into um, our first agenda item was really talking about strategy. Um, and when you mentioned core, um, it was interesting way back when an agency I had a chance to um, be responsible for at the regional level, that became our number one. Uh, because it was always easy to look at the bright, shiny objects and say, oh, we're going to go after this or emergency issues, which we'll hear about some today, that become kind of the priority. But if you forget the core of what you do, um, you can't do all the other things. So I'm I'm pleased as I was reading through the drafts that uh, that uh, is where a focus is going to be for us going forward. So I will now turn it over to Jonathan Sandow, ODA Assistant Director for a kickoff and discussion of our overall strategy. Right where we were last time you were here. Uh, Chair Miller, Director Sharpe Hansen, members of the board, Jonathan Sando, Oregon Department of Agriculture. Um, you have in in the packet um, our outline uh, for for strategic plan. The final product will look different. This is a working outline, right? It's very it's it's kind of just as as is. Um, and then behind there are some of the slides. I'll walk through the slides. Um, I'm not going to go point by point with the the strategic plan itself, but for kind of additional detail, you can follow along there. Jonathan, yep. can I interrupt. Would you like to introduce the committee members? I will to start off. That might be helpful as well. Thank you. Well, just one second. Can you can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Uh, so we started. Um, this is kind of a summary of of our old um, our previous strategic plan, um, 2018 to 2023, and it expired last year. And so when uh, Lisa joined us, we began the process of a new strategic plan. Uh, we had to move fast on it. Um, our goal was to wrap this up by by the end of May. Uh, which was going to include a lot of internal, external um, kind of conversations, workload, 
uh, being able to bring in a lot of information, a lot of changes happened since you know 2016, 17, when when the last big efforts of the other strategic plan was underway. And so, you know, as the exec team, we all got together. We we kind of charted out a course, and then uh, a little bit smaller team uh, kind of really met all the time. Um, we we did a lot of the work, um, and. And you have, I think, all but one in the room with us today. Um, so I'll start with Sunny Summers, who's online um, b back in Salem. Uh, Sunny was part of the small team. Carla was part of the team. Uh, Jess, Andrea Cantu Shomez, and then Aaron Lockett out of Food Safety. Um, we're really kind of the, the the key champions here, the core workers, um, being able to kind of push push and pull, and make sure that one we stayed on track, uh, two that we were. Uh, within the bounds of what a strategic plan was um, and then and then it maintaining you know just ensuring that we're we're staying engaged and the process was was robust um, and so really we started the the process that we started with was looking at this at this previous strategic plan a lot of work had gone into it um, it, there was a lot of details. You can see we had seven objectives there to get through. We had mission, vision, core values. There's a lot behind it as well. Um, and but a good chunk of those years were uh, were dedicated to um, pandemic responses, wildfire responses, drought responses. Um, you name it. We were working on a lot of other things than than really the outlines of the strategic plan. And so there was a lot that we could carry forward, um, a lot that we've learned, and 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 looking, you know, kind of in those next few years, uh, a lot of good opportunity on where we can go. But really, what came out, um, you know, one I think good example that came out of that strategic plan. Uh, I know we've presented on this before to the board, but maybe not everybody had really seen it or, or delved into the meaning behind this logo. Uh, but our new logo was part of that that overarching strategic plan. And there's a lot more to it than just, you know, a nice little golden arch, some green leaves and, and a semicircle blue on the bottom. There's representation there of of one, the fundamental elements of agriculture, right? The sun, the leaves, the water, um, the circle that encompasses all of those things, but then also the different different growing regions and geographic regions of Oregon. So, the, you know, kind of the high deserts, the drier arid areas, um, you know, the, the fertile valleys of, of the, the Columbia Plateau down through the Willamette Valley, um, and then and then the water, right? Our coastal communities are, you know, the 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 bloodline of our of our work. And then again, the circle that encompasses all the work that we do at ODA, all the work that we do at OD, or, or through Oregon Ag. And so, there's a lot of meaning. There's a lot of you know context behind what what appears to be quite a simple logo, um, but a lot of a lot of work went into that, embodying you know what we've done in the past strategic plan, but then also pulling us forward. And then in addition to that work, um, this is about about a two minute, I think, video um, we'll play here today. Um, I, it should work for folks online. We, we we ran through this presentation with staff last week. It worked fine, uh, but, you know, technology is, is what it is. Uh, and out of the again, part of the 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 last strategic plan part of the messaging building on the logo was really developing this manifesto video so i i believe we played it for some some folks on the board maybe years ago so this will be new for for some maybe a repeat for others but we'll just take a two minutes here and just kind of watch the video hopefully Let's see if this works But well, we had it working last time. Okay, if somebody on, oh, yeah, it's gonna give me a bad feedback loop. It's playing on our side. Yeah, that's what I figured. We don't have video because it's coming through. Are we able to get audio through here? Yeah. It's as vast as the oceans of Oregon meet, the barriers and livelihoods travel, and as microscopic as a suspect bacteria. It's known there's actually a gallon of that gallon of gas pump. And those eggs inside the department are safe to scramble. It's about fertile fields, 
fresh fruits and standing medium rare. And ranges from monkey boots to sterile cleaners. Fighting for bees and ballad invasive species. Yeah, we wear a lot of hats. Not all of them eat of some big variety. But the Oregon Department of Agriculture, 400 plus passionate folks juggling one epic to do list, officially we educate, advise, inspect, <laughs> certify, market, advocate, and the list goes on. Sure, we ensure Oregon's rich harvests get safely and efficiently to those who love it and yields a sustainable living for those along the way. It's the least we can do for the farmers, ranchers, packers, fishers, ranchers, and early riders who make the run in Oregon speak volumes worldwide. This being Oregon, there's something more. While others see success in today's terms, we're tasked with higher duty, our tomorrow, and the next day. So we view things through a wider lens, ensuring that everything done today safeguards our clean water, fertile soil, and ripe abundance of generations to come. After all, apples and dollars and backpacks are forever, as long as we, all of us at ODA, can help. The Oregon Department of Agriculture protect, promote, prosper. So for folks who might uh, would like to see that video again or um, kind of revisit it, is on, it is on our our YouTube page. Um, it's it's one that we do show. Uh, we we've shown numbers of times in front of our budget committee um, with legislators, and uh, we try we, we use it because it's it summarizes a good amount of what we do in about two minutes, um, which is a lot faster than I could do it. Even though I like to speak fast and, and a lot of volume of words, but um, it's much more succinct. So. But I do want to pull uh, just one kind of the last little quote there that we use um, in that in that video. Um, we are tasked with the higher duty our tomorrow. Uh, we take a wider lens to safeguard our clean water, fertile soil, ripen abundance for generations to come. This this really captured, I think, at its at its essence, um, you know, the last mission vision statement, um, and then really really helped us guide in terms of our efforts looking forward. Um, you know what what. What is ODA? What do we want to be? Who who are we to the ag community? Um, who we are to the to the larger enterprise? And so, as we worked through this um, process with with the strategic plan, we kind of broke it into these three phases um, to keep us on track and to keep us going. So, kind of phase one, January through February, um, kind of really getting getting organized, getting going, um, building out our processes, building out our timelines, uh, and really working in in trying to in trying to make sure that we're we're capturing all of our internal pieces. The second phase there, February through March, um, you know, kind of that get focused phase was really conversations internally, externally, amongst ourselves, amongst other folks, right? Lots of lots of um, lots of good feedback, lots of good pieces. Um, and then that third phase, uh, kind of where we're at now, um, and then where we're going to head into the next month is is really bringing it all together, synthesizing it down, making sense of it all, building goals, and then putting us on track for the end of May uh, to be able to have to be able to have a strategic plan. I will say that you know, in contrast to the previous strategic plan, again, seven key objectives. It was a five-year strategic plan. It was it was um, you know a a a, a, a pretty um, heavy document. The, this this uh, style of strategic plan is really going to be about a three, maybe four year work strategic plan. So the goals are meant to be um, kind of almost adaptive and, and, and movable. And, you know, as we achieve one thing, we move on to the next right They're in are working with each other. Um, so one. This is not the last time the board will hear or engage around the strategic plan. So, you know, I know we have a good amount of time here to work on this, uh, but we will continue this, right? These are this is what's going to be driving our budgets. This is what's going to be driving, you know, our, our prioritization of resources. Like this is where we're really going to work back into. Um, but again, it's supposed to be on a shorter time frame, uh, you know, a bit more moving faster. And so, you know, in that in that phase one piece again, um, really trying to set the stage to it um, that that internal committee that we talked about, uh, you know, 
and amongst the the work that we're doing around those kind of those core elements, um, we also have an equity statement. Um, it's 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 in the draft plan, um, and and we looked at that, and then a big heavy a heavy piece, and we have more more around that later. But um, big heavy piece that we really undertook was a SWOT analysis. So we had an all staff meeting uh, in January, and that's where we really kicked off kind of a. Hey, this is the start of our strategic plan building. Um, here's kind of what our expectations are of ourselves, of, of um, both internally and externally, of a staff as as the core steering committee, and and part of that was uh, was right there in the staff meeting. We had some note cards to be able to capture because we had a lot of folks that travel in. Um, we we had we had live note cards right there to capture some of the SWAT pieces. Um, and and then we did an online uh, kind of survey and we did a uh, was it four four or five four yep so folks online who uh back into the microphone we had about four sessions with about 10 folks um each from from around the agency that really fed into the into the SWOT analysis um and we got a lot a lot of good feedback. Um, and so SWOT analysis, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. This is really looking internally, right? So what is the what is the strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are your opportunities? And then what are the threats to achieving your mission, right? To, to, to aspiring to the vision, to accomplishing your SMART goals, right? And so really looking at that internal component of that. There are a lot more words to this um, inside of the draft strategic plan. There's even there's an incredible amount more information um, that we gathered, we synthesized, we try to make big themes. And so what you're seeing is is the smallest, you know, uh, focus point um, there on the screen around these, around the big themes that we tried to capture. But the strengths here um, that really were were highlighted and brought to us were, were the people, the people of the agency. Um, there's a huge strength about who we are, what we do, how we do our things, the culture of compliance. So not, you know, kind of being the first regulatory step, right? We are, you know, we we do a lot of educational compliance. You know, we work with folks to to get to get where we need to be, um, and then the the identity of expertise. We have a lot of good experts in the agency. A lot of, um, you know, and recognition of that um, elevation of that. Uh, the the weaknesses, um, you know, some of the weaknesses that might get in our way of achieving our mission and vision, uh, communication. Both internally and externally, uh, you know, I I think that's always an ongoing challenge, right? The dynamics of communication are always difficult, but there are certainly there are certainly uh, areas of of significant improvement that we can make internally to our agency, and so that way, you know, our staff who are, you know, in the field, um, you know, in in different in different areas, we have 38. Um, yeah, 38 programs inside the agency, right? And so that's a lot of different information, different touch points that you have to get to folks, uh, but making sure that folks are feeling, you know, uh, you know, successful when they're engaging with customers, right? Having good information, timely information. Uh, insufficient technology. You'll see this, uh, we saw this loud and clear, uh, a, a common theme across, you know, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So we try to put it in where, where it made sense. Um, but insufficient technology, uh, both both in, in our internal side, but then also how we engage with, with our customers, right? Um, we're in a very digital world. Um, we're in a very fast moving world. Folks are very used to uh, potentially a different way of doing business than what uh, ODA offers as a primary opportunity. Uh, we reactiveness uh you know part of the part of the weakness um feedback was that we tend to be very reactive and not proactive um, in spaces that we can see coming that we can hear about um, some of that is challenges of being government but some of that you know is definitely areas that we can improve where we can um, to have a more proactive approach to to our our how we conduct our work and how we engage with folks and then operational resources uh, you know this you know any any sorts of budgets, um, any sorts of you know ad additional resources that we can uh, we can support ourselves internally with and and operationalize with opportunities. Um, agency alignment, like I said, we have 38, 38 programs. Um, at times that that can be a challenge to make it feel as one ODA. Um, there some of them are very distinct from each other. Some of them are very uh, you know, very, very aligned with other parts of the agency that they might not communicate a lot with and may not know that there's a lot of alignment there. 
Um, but there is. We all um, we all are working again towards the same same mission. Um, we all have the same vision. We all operate under the same core values. Um, we are all one ODA. Ultimately, we're all one enterprise. But um, having that agency alignment um, is a good opportunity for us to be able to to kind of achieve what what we're setting out to do. Modernization again. Uh, we have our new CIO Ryan in the room, um, and so I know he's going to get. You know, we're, we're we we like to. We like to you know, beat up on them a little bit, but hopefully not too much here. Uh, modernization of the agency, right? Not only modernizing you know, the tools that we have at our, at our um, disposal to be able to do our jobs, but then also modernizing how we do our jobs, right? There are some areas where we may just need to change how we do things um, in order to do it, uh, to, to meet the expectations and the demands of, of today's world. Um, engagement again. This is kind of aligned with the communication. There's a lot of opportunity engagement, but engagement in in communities, populations, and sectors of Oregon that we may not typically and or historically engage with today, um, and really trying to make a concerted and, and direct effort to be able to reach out to you know everyone. We say we're an agency for everyone, right? We food safety weights and you know everyone interacts with our agency. We need to reflect that both internally and how we do our jobs. Uh, and then career development, uh, really, really within our own agency, right? Identifying opportunities for for folks to advance, um, you know, hopefully within ODA, but certainly advance within their career goals and their professional desires, um, and and really, you know, use use ODA to be to be a good place to either um, stay and, and grow professionally or take you know develop into you know wherever fits their professional goals and needs, um, and then threats. Uh, one of the threats I think that that we heard a lot about was um, adaptability, and so you know, be, either you know, reluctant or or unable because of you know, op, you know, resources and whatever. Um, but the 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 adaptability, we always got to stay adaptive. We always got to stay kind of dynamic in in motion, um, responsiveness, uh, maintaining you know, kind of that customer service as that core, right? We are you know. Our perception, our engagement, um, you know, all those pieces rely on how how responsive we are to ourselves, to our customers, um, you know, to to uh, the community, to most, you know, most people who engage with us, right? Having quick responsiveness, have quality of responsiveness. Um, unstable technology, technology seeps in again um, in our threats category, but having that unstable technology is, is you know, if, if we're not able to kind of grow and adapt with the changing needs, that's going to really hamstring, you know, how we can do things. You know, we're always asked to be, we're always asked to do more with the less. Um, and so where where can we accomplish that you know calling? Um, and it's it's to leverage a lot of a lot of resources that we're not leveraging uh, today. And then talent retention. Um, and this goes back to the career development of those opportunities, but really in the recruitment and retention of talent. Um, so how can we be competitive, but then how can we all also offer a lot of those opportunities um, with within the within the agency to to retain our our, our talent? Um, and then a little bit broader, we heard that and we'll get to Pesto, but we also heard a little bit of that talent retention, you know, even within the ag community as, as a as a larger whole. Um, but again, this is a lot of like kind of those internal pieces around the SWOT analysis. Um, there we go. So, yep. Uh, so this is just a quote from um, from our equity statement. It's it's a it, like I said, it's longer inside the draft. Um, we're not putting up all you know all the pieces of it on on the PowerPoint, um, but. But ODA commits to integrating equity into our identity, ensuring that we are recognized as an agency that protects, promotes, and prospers. So really anchors it back to, um, you know, that, that central tagline, that central theme of a mission. Uh, but then, you know, bringing that in, bring, you know, embedding it into everything that we're doing. And so folks are not only, you know, heard, seen, but there's the sense of, you know, community, belonging, um, you know, that, that we're, you know, we're, we're working deliberately and, and objectively uh, towards all those um, core pieces of, of who we are, who we want to be. Um, and then and and within that equity statement, again, it's a bit longer um, in the draft, but putting that front and center with our mission, vision, core values, equity statement. So second phase. Um, that was a lot of data collection. It was a lot of information to go through. Um, it was a lot of work from um from from the team that that led all those sessions that went through um, analyzed it broke it down to themes and so then we moved on but the second part here was around a, a pestle analysis and so this is the external pieces of it um and so we uh 
we did a lot of um, kind of ident identifying who who out in the um, community we needed to bring into this process, who we can engage, um, and we did a significant amount of outreach. Um, we had our our executive team, and then we had managers reaching out to folks, collecting a bunch of data, doing surveys, doing information, um, and. And this is one area that we heard that we could do better uh, to provide our staff with some better uh, context some better setup um, and 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 set them up for a bit more success. So, you know, um, you know, in the last in the last part where we talked around the, the staff meeting, um, I think it was important that that, you know, we got what we we had set out to achieve. I think the conversations, you know, absent of, of doing that, um, you know, a little bit better setup and uh, and work up up front to set up them all for success to get to get the information that we needed out. We had good engagement on uh, from our external partners. We had good engagement from from our internal folks to get that information to bring it back to synthesize it down. Um, and so, you know, that's something that that I own that we learned from um, and that we will continue to 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 improve on. But uh, one, just a huge uh, thank you to all of the staff that that participated, but then also to, you know, anybody who's listening from uh, from the public comment side who did participate in that. Uh, it was super helpful. We got a lot of good information. We got, got a lot of good feedback. I know it took a lot of time. Time is valuable, um, but we got there and we took we took that information. We brought in our core values our mission vision, and then we created goals and outcomes. So. Hustle analysis. Um, it's it's an acronym for political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental. Again, a lot of information brought in. We have more kind of details within within the draft plan. This is the the most highlighted um, summary of it. Uh, kind of just going through. I won't go one by one, but the political side of things. Um, you know, the unstable support programs is really around like the disaster programs, the crop insurance, right? Those the pro the support programs that that help kind of stabilize the peaks and valleys that are our agriculture, um, trade policy and agreements. Um, you know, the dynamics of the markets, things that influence. You know, again, the the pricing and and, and input costs and all those types of things. Um, uh, one that we didn't put up here, I do think it's in the plan, but um, was a lot around the polarization, right? The the polarization around the politics that makes it really difficult to navigate to to operate. Um, economic side of things, uh, again, market demand, the cost of um, cost of doing business, the access to capital, uh, workforce readiness, um, all all big bright themes that kind of came out in that process. The the social side of it, um, aging producers, um, you know what what happens when um, you know when when there's a lot of potential land asset ownership transfer in the next you know in the coming years consumer preference changes um, how do how, how does production side of that adapt to consumer uh, uh, preference changes when that is you know ongoing um, urbanization trends on the technology side uh, advancements farming technologies both both mechanical and biological um, and then both and then the perception of technology and agriculture was uh, was was potentially a big a big risk and a big threat um, information and resources so the availability of it the timeliness of it the helpfulness of information that that are out there for for folks to to gather um, on the legal side a uh, lot of regulation um, conversations, a lot of workforce liability um, conversations. This is where we had a lot of ag overtime, um, you know, uh, Im immigration conversations, availability of labor um, was a lot, a lot that we heard from um, from from our uh, external partners. And then on the environmental side, the threats of climate change, um, the threats of, of mitigating around, you know, different types of pest diseases and then climate spark practices, how, you know, how can ODA either be a, be a leader in that or, um, you know, kind of be a, a continual carrier of, a, of the climate smart practices that are out there and what, you know, what's our role there. So again, this is a lot of the external pieces that, um, factor in and influence either how we're able to to be um, successful in our mission vision, but then also, you know, you know, for us to be successful, right? The ag community has to be um, successful. And so, what are those threats for for that success look like? This is that summary um, kind of statement there. So we took all all of that um, all those pieces together. 
and and we set we set forward looking at kind of that previous previous strategic plan where we wanted to go uh and and we looked around you know what what drives us what 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 are what are the values of oda what are these core values um there are enterprise values um you know accountability there's there's a few i think there's four of them um and so we looked at what what are those enterprise values we set those to the side right those are kind of the ones that we already got um and so what is makes oda what are the values that make oda oda um and so we really looked at approachable and again these are in these are in the in the draft strategic plan with a little bit more explanation to them uh, but approachable right we want to be we want to be somewhere where folks are 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 willing to come right they they, they see us as a as a good partner um, we're, we're embodying kind of that welcoming environment both and in, externally internally um, genuine uh, it, you know it's a people's based approach right we want to be authentic we want to be genuine in what we're doing how we're doing it the relationships emphasizing honesty and integrity um, those are direct you know kind of anchors into our previous core values that we had uh, growth oriented you know, I think this is in response to some a direct response to a lot that we heard through our SWOT analysis. But uh, you know, we want to embrace kind of that continuous improvement, right? Being able to to continually analyze how we're doing it, why we're doing it, what we're doing, uh, to 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 make sure that not only are we meeting the demands of today, but that we're you know that we're staying relevant, that we're staying um, in front of in front of folks. Uh, inclusive, um, you know, this again, this is really both. Uh, internally, right within our own staff, but then externally within you know the communities that we uh, engage with on a on a regular basis, but also on, uh, with communities that we don't engage with on a regular basis. Um, and so, you know, again, making sure that that you know with through all of our processes, all of our programs, um, that people are heard, valued, and seen, um, and that they they show up and they're you know they know that they're, they're going to be respected. Um, experts, we had. Uh, experts, you know, kind of that climate of, of expertise uh, Our, I think our previous strategic plan. And even in this one, um, we had we had the scientific based, right? And and we were going to be, you know, the scientific base, which is still at this core of, of this experts. But it was pointed out to us that not everything that we do in this agency is necessarily scientifically driven. Um, we have experts in many other fields than just the scientific fields. Um, you know, I, I I like to say I'm probably a really good example of that I'm not a scientist, but I am an expert uh, um, BSer, right? I can come up here and talk to you forever. I can I can get myself out of a corner, right? Um, I'm really good at that. It's not scientific based, uh, but we are full of experts in this agency um, who are really good at what they do, really good at their jobs, and so um, part of that expertise lives within these core values, right? We pride ourselves on that. Um, and then sustainability, right? We want to be an agency that's not only here for ourselves, you know, for for um, you know our our staff and everybody internally um, into tomorrow, but we want to be an agency that's you know sustainable going forward for the community, right? We want to be the you know the the thought partners. We want to be the the folks that are helping advance the missions and goals of of each one of you, your communities, um, and folks around. And so, really looking at that together. Um, and so. If you're if you're sticking with us here, um, you know I know we we talked about this down. I think when uh, uh, Chair Miller hosted us down in Roseburg, but uh, you know at at our core, you know we are we are Aggies, right? We are approachable, genuine, growth oriented, inclusive experts um, who believe in sustainability, and so you know we are we are part of that that identity. Um, those are a lot of words. There's a lot of core values to memorize, to remember. Um, and so we'll we'll bake it into a little bit of a soft identity that we can carry through um, our everyday work and that people can remember. And yes, we did go full circle. Oh, and then our our little our little uh, I, I mentioned this before clicking forward. Uh, you know, we're, you know, we are approachable, genuine, growth oriented, inclusive experts who build on sustainability at ODA for, uh, oh, I didn't fix that from last time, uh, for for tomorrow and agriculture communities for generations to come. And, and we are the Aggies, uh, all of us, all, you know, 400, 500, um, as we come up and down in seasonals, uh, we believe in the same mission, right? We believe in the same core values. We're here to do the same things. And so, uh, what what is that mission? Um, we had the previous mission um, with us, and it was it was kind of long, um, and so we really synthesized it down. We wordsmithed it around, 
Uh, and we really came up, we looked at our tagline and we thought that that, enc that encompassed our mission pretty well. Uh, you know, our mission is to protect, our mission is to promote, and our mission is to prosper. Full stop. Well, what does that mean then, right? We felt like we needed, we needed a little bit more explanation. And so uh, we wrote, uh, which was pointed out to us in our, in our through our staff uh, conversations, a very long sentence with lots of commas, um, you know, a, a, a nice long sentence that incorporates a lot of, you know, kind of the previous mission vision statements. Um, this one, we had, we had a lot of good conversation around this with our staff um, and we have taken notes. We did not change this. We did not, I did, we did not edit anything between that conversation and now. Right. Um, and so, uh, and so we're, it's not that we didn't hear anybody. We like we have that information. We're going to take information from um, feedback from everyone here today as well, and go back and re revisit it. Um, you know, I think that there was some wordsmithing, some changing. Uh, a good point out that we're missing kind of any any indication and nod to water. Um, we just said natural and working lands. Um, and so, you know, kind of incorporating those missing pieces. I I, you know, presume this is. A slide we'll come back to um, kind of once we wrap up and you see the whole picture um, and, and kind of work through a little bit more here. Uh, but then our vision. So our mission is really, you know, what what are we doing? What what drives us? What gets us up? Our vision is, you know, where where do we where do we want to be? Right? What why are we doing all these things? And it's it's for a resilient tomorrow for generations to come. Uh, resilient agriculture, resilient ODA, a resilient um, you know economy, rural communities. Um, you know, I know Lisa has her has her three pillars that she likes to to emphasize every time she speaks, and it, it encompasses all three of those, and and but sets it out for that longer term vision, right? That higher goal. Again, calling back to that initial quote that we had um, is really looking looking at the higher duty of tomorrow. Uh, so the emerging themes before we get into the the smart goals, um, you know, the kind of those emerging themes that we saw pull out from both the SWAT, the PESTL, um, you know, ex other conversations, information that we all kind of were able to gather, uh, you know, economic and environmental um, concerns, uh, focus on customer service, recruitment and retention of, of staff and talent, um, stable funding, more robust funding, um, which I think every every state agency can, you know, will will always put on their list. Um, being adaptable, right? Having that adaptability piece again. IT infrastructure, modernization, how we do it. Succession so planning, right? Making sure that we have, you know, folks ready, ready to um, to step into roles that are critical to the agency. The depths of knowledge, you know, you're no, you're never going to be able to replace individuals, um, you know, on a holistic level. But being able to make sure that we're not, you know, tripping over our own selves as we're as as we go through. Um, you know, growing and then communication, uh, both externally and internally, um, you know, kind of those communication pieces. So that leads us then to um, the SMART goals and SMART goals. So SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time bound. Um, and we we started with two. Um, we developed the two, and then again through a lot, you know, more conversation, more feedback, we kind of added we added the third one around customer focus survey and so service. And so the first ones that we had was organizational excellence, um, agency modernization, and then customer focus service uh, as our as our kind of our three big smart goals. And so the the. The, the first one that we have here is is the organizational excellence. And so what are the outcomes? You know, what are what are those what are the outcomes underneath that big goal? Um, one is to become a mission driven agency um, and, and that's to implement, you know, a strategic organization structure. A lot of um, how we're structured is driven by, you know, previous previous budget dynamics, right? We we had to do it to, to be able to do it. This time we have we want to be able to take that strategic look and make sure um, you know, we're structured the way we are in some areas. The answer might be yes. Some areas, the answers might be no, um, but we'll, we're, we're, we want to take a deliberate approach rather than a, again, a reactive approach to it. Um, the 2025, uh, 27, uh, budget, right? We're in budget development right now. Again, mission driven budget, right? What do we need to do to be able to do our core work, to be able to serve the, 
to serve those that we're that depend on you know that rely on each other um, implement our DEI action plan. You'll see the asterisks there that we're, we're identifying that, um, you know, the part of these goals are part of our action plan, but implementing that DEI action plan. Um, develop internal performance measures to be able to, to drive prioritization of resources, right? To be able to understand where, where we need to um, spend our, our, both our, our human capital and our and our financial capital, and then, you know, customer centric services. You know, putting the customer again at the cent center of that center of the core there, and really developing around them. And then business continuity, um, you know, implement succession planning system. Um, we have a whole we have a, a, a pretty robust succession plan. That's a, another document, whole another process. Uh, but you know, developing off of that work, and then enterprise space planning. Um, I think this is a relevant one with, with you know you all sitting in this building here. It's it's a new space, right? We're we're occupying it as a new space um, outside of you know when as we're still trying to figure out how to adapt from you know working from home, working in offices, not only ODA but on the enterprise wide. There's a big look across all state buildings, all state assets to to really understand. You know, how are we utilizing it? Are we utilizing it the best way that it can? Um, that that is a very live exercise right now, um, and so we fully anticipate within the within the life of the strategic plan. Um, you know, that's going to become part of one of our outcomes and our um, part of our goals here. So, and then the second the second big goal is uh, agency modernization. Um, this this is a lot a lot rooted in our IT strategic plan and you know and and modernizing our IT infrastructure so we can continue to again be adaptive and um, reliable in terms of how we deliver our customer service, but also then in, improve customer engagement tools. Um, you know, there's. You know, I know I know that you know a lot of folks still like to rely on you know fax machines and those types of things you know and in an era of smartphones and apps and you know all those different ways of how we do businesses we have to we have to expand how we how we offer engagement tools across um, and, and meet meet a wide variety of needs and 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 opportunities um, not saying that one is better than another but just that we need to be able to to capture how we engage with folks um, and, and how they want to engage with us. Leverage that technology to improve operational efficiency. Um, enhance you know, communication and collaboration tools, again, internally and externally, and then in, you know, modernize internal procedures and so that we're efficient as we can with your resources, and then we're able to re reinvest and refocus all those you know, additional pieces on the core work and the core mission um, to, to deliver. And then the third, that third SMART goal, um, really, really maintain the customer focused service um, and embed it in what we do. And so, you know, kind of what what are the strategic, uh, what, what's the strategy under there? Well, you know, establish a good baseline, needs of areas of improvement, um, opt optimize resources that focus on efficient and quality, you know, on that on that first contact, right? I, you know, we've all we've all contacted, um, you know, various government agencies or or other entities and you know and and having that expectation that folks are really going to be able to do something meaningfully maybe not solve it all together but meaningfully you know the first time you engage with them versus you know oh we'll get back to you we'll send you an email we'll pass you along you know oh you call the wrong department click you know those types of things um and so really being able to 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 work on that first contact um embed the one oda ethos um for cons consistent authentic customers experience and so you know you know maybe barbara calls me for a weights and measures thing well you know i could tell her well i'm not weights and measures see you later well that's not that's not embed embedding that one oda ethos right we want to be able to champion that we want to be able to deliver a consistent and authentic customer service uh and then the continuous improvement by measuring ourselves right being it being adaptive to what we see is you know uh, you know why are one things off why are one things doing well right where can we go um or change in expectations right so that brings us to phase three, really where we are today. Um, and, and this is kind of where we are in the process. Uh, we have not, uh, you know, I think you'll look in the draft or for, or for folks who are very familiar with strategic planning, um, you know, we'll know the next step is really creating the, the very detailed, well, how are we gonna get this done? How are we gonna execute on these things? Um, and that that is the next, that is the big next lift, um, but we didn't, 
you know, we wanted to make sure we had enough conversation um, with a wide range of folks to make sure one, we were on track, uh, but then two, that, you know, that we didn't develop so far down the road, it, it seemed like it was irreversible. Um, and so, you know, we're doing, we took a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of feedback from staff continuing to take that, um, in, you know, input today. And then, and then we'll continue to create that plan and 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 execute on year one implementation um, going forward. Again, our target goal is is by the end of May to be to be pretty well wrapped up um, and done. And so, those those are kind of the next steps that we have um, in front of us. And uh, with that, I know that we still have some a good amount of time. Hopefully, we'll have some good good conversation, good feedback here today, um, and then. We will be able to to implement that again. This is not this is not kind of a one conversation and done. You see how this will stick with us. You'll see how this will will be part of our budget, be part of our ongoing conversations, um, driving a lot of a lot of pieces that we do here in the agency. So, with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Chair Miller, and let the conversations go. All right. Well, why don't we uh, begin uh, by um, asking uh, the board if if you have any questions on what's presented and then we can transition and move into ideas uh, for feedback. Uh, but I just want to say, wow, thank you for all the effort. Um, great team of people. Obviously, you did it in a very short time frame for strategic planning purposes, and and I think I really really like the approach. So so thank you for for all the the great work. So questions. Director Boyer, Barbara Boyer. Um, I don't really have a question. I just have a comment. Um, I really appreciate the vulnerability in this with the weaknesses and the threats. I just, I think it makes you stronger when you can admit where you're weak. So um, I appreciate that a lot. And they're they're really meaningful too. Like I'm like, oh yes, they make a lot of sense. Um, so I, I appreciate that. And then I love the fun part of it, the Aggies. So thank you. It just brings a smile to my face. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, Dr. Simonich. Uh, Dean Simonich, member of the board, I would just say a lot of great work here, right? I, I sat through and read this over the weekend and wow, it's it's good and it's right on the money in many, many ways. So um, I'm excited about it. Thanks for everyone's good work. Well, I actually have one area that I'd like to just explore a little bit, and, and it goes back to the word promote in the vision. And, you know, I'm thinking back to uh, the time during COVID in particular, um, where um, there was so much going on, so many different agencies, um, and what I saw, uh, and actually, Jonathan, it was you in a lot of those meetings, saw agriculture doing was let's make sure we educate our fellow agencies on the unique needs of agriculture um, and be able to advocate for agriculture in those needs. You know, you look at agencies and whether it be a DEQ that's focused on environment and other, but we're, as the Department of Agriculture that is a regulatory agency as well as promoting agriculture, uh, we promote internationally, but also promoting within the agency. <clears throat> Any more of these days, I think people know, <clears throat> excuse my <clears throat> voice, people know less about agriculture. And so I, I don't know where that weaves in exactly, whether that weaves in or, or the customer service piece or exactly where, but I think now is a time where, at least from my perspective, and, and I don't know if other fellow board members feel the same way, that um, we need ODA to be able to feel comfortable with the board supporting the promotion of the issues facing agriculture when it comes to fellow agencies as well as, as people in, in, uh, you know, throughout um, the communities. So I don't know if anybody else has any perspective on that, or maybe I'm just alone on that one, but. 
and where to fit in. Yeah, uh, Chair Miller, that, that's a that's that's a helpful feedback because I think a lot of times when we you know when we see the word promote right, our minds like automatically go to the economic promotion <laughs> right, the marketing, the, the the you know the that direct promotion of products you know and those types of things. And so that's a um, I think that's a good good piece to bring forward or just around you know not only you know not only the promotion of agri agriculture but then the promotion within the agency and what we do how we do it. Might I add just a little bit um, for the record, Lisa Sharp Lohansen, director. I think the other place when I think about promote, it's promote the agricultural sector. There's a market promoting ODA in itself of itself and the opportunities uh, in terms of career. Mm -hmm. um, when we interact with young people, work with Oregon FFA, um, OSU's uh, Agribusiness Club and Sigma. The professional sorority that that um, we were with on Friday night. Those are promotional opportunities, not only for the agricultural sector, but for the agency and being an ambassador for public service. Mm -hmm. And so, I think that the word promote it really does encompass a lot of things. Yeah, Ela Miller, uh, for the record, again, just again, just to have some specificity around that uh, to provide the um, agency with the uh, the department with the opportunity to step in and step up. And I know you do, but I think having it in the strategic plan is helpful too. Other comments? I'm curious about feedback. So this is Lisa, I'm going to ask a question. I do this a lot. Um, how do people like the short mission statement with the three direct words rather than the long narrative? I like it. I mean, it's it's easy, it's precise, it's um, we, it's memorable. <laughs> Whereas when it's there's a lot of words, you can't remember it. So I like the preciseness of it. Eric Orm, board member. I I would agree with Barbara. It's when you when you try to put too much into it, it, it becomes unachievable. And when you're more direct and you keep it simple, then we don't get lost in the fluff and the extra stuff that gets put in there. Um, one extra comment on the promotion, um, and I know ODA does a good job, but with the legislature also and, and the governor and making sure that they understand how agriculture works today. Uh, it seems like every time we go to Salem, we're retraining and retraining and, and having to re-explain ourselves over and over and over again. I, and I think a lot of it becomes or comes from the the change uh, that's constantly happening in Salem and and uh, it it's I you know myself as a as a producer always invite the legislature or the governor out to the east side of the state to understand what we we tackle every day and and very rarely the governor usually makes it out but very rarely do legislature legislators make it out. Um, so that's when I think of promotion, that's what I'm thinking is promoting to to the people that don't understand because they're so disconnected. So thank you. Yes, um, Director Santa Maria. Yes, uh, Lisa Santa Maria for the record. Well, I really like the structure of this strategic plan is really friendly <laughs> and concrete and I really like how you put together all the values so anyone can go back and think about it all the time and um, just the one I mentioned that it's one of the most friendly strategic plans I have <laughs> seen lately and yes go easy to go back and review what are your main points and that's my comment thank you Jonathan, you had asked on the mission um, about other word smithing, other ideas, and we have that up there again. So, um, and water, 
was one of the comments, but maybe could you spend a little bit more time about what you might be asking us to provide you on that? I definitely, you know, and I, I would call the protect, promote, prosper, kind of like tagline focus. And then the actual statement is below if I'm reading it correctly. But, um, you know, just again, there's still a lot of words there. Um, so what what are you looking for? What do you want from us in that? Chair Miller, uh, good question. I think that there was so when we when we brought it up with um, with staff, so I, I would say part of the wrestling that um, that the exec team had when we were putting this draft together, um, you know, we, we looked at the promote or protect promote prosper right mission statement uh and then trying to trying to unpack you know well what does that mean right put it into a little bit more of a context so i think the first question would be is this the right context is this enough context to kind of explain what what the pro protect promote prosper uh, mission is uh and then you know really looking at it you know in terms of does it does it capture kind of everything that um that if you if, again, if you needed that additional context, you're able to walk away with it in terms of saying, "Yep, I understand," you know, what the agency's mission is, right? I understand what drives their what drives their programs. Um, again, I think the inclusion of water was was a good um, was was a good comment that was brought up. Uh, we also there's a lot of conversation just around, um, you know, you know, responding to changing needs through assistance. Um, and then compliance was compliance the right terminology we had regulatory in our previous mission statement um you know we kind of moved to compliance in this one to capture that uh we had a, we had some good conversations around that and then the promotion um you know ar around food and ag i think it was a it was so, some of that conversation too was was a good reminder too that um you know around everything that we do you know ultimately needs to touch on all three of these um because we had we we definitely had different you know emphasis is getting put on you know either the assist the compliance or the promotion you know conversations of it um and so but i think in that you know through those conversations through through what we had there um you know i think the big question is just you know does this provide the right context and enough context for folks to really understand what that per, you know protect promote prosper really is trying to convey, really is trying to get out. Um, you know, go back to that video, right? You know, all those pieces of the of of what we do that the, you know, the ethos driven there is it is it captured um well enough in here. I know we were gonna go back and look. Um, you know, we we also had some good conversations, some good uh some some suggestions that came in around, you know, maybe even breaking it up to like, you know, protect, this is what it would mean. Promote, this is what it would mean. Prosper, this is what it would mean. Um you know, I think we're going to go back and look around uh, when we did the tagline, right? When we did the logo, uh, what was the meanings around those when we developed all of that? Um, and and maybe we can bring some of those that language forward to to put it in together. So uh, again, I think the overall question, right? The simple question is: Is this the right and enough context to explain what that means? Because again, it's a, more of an explanation paragraph to the mission. Mm -hmm. That's those three. Director Hens. Sorry. So I'll give a little historical um, context to this. If you go back a couple mission statements ago, it really focused on the three pillars of our statutory responsibilities. So protect was about protecting natural resources, protecting consumers, protecting the people of Oregon. Uh, promote was about promoting agriculture, whether that be promoting agriculture as a whole, um, market development, et cetera. And then Prosper, I think, hit on that economic piece of it. Although I think about it a lot in terms of communities, local com communities mm -hmm. today. Um, but really there, there were, those were, were the focuses of, of the uh, three-pronged sustainable stool. And if you look at the statutory, statutory responsibilities, that's what it comes down to. And so I think that's where the words came from. Now the challenge becomes, it's like, do we need to have um, the additional statement laying some of that out, which is the below part, 
and I, I think if I could do it again, I would put the below part probably with um, in parentheses or with what are they called? Quotes, Quotes around it, you know, as, as the explainer to it. And I think that's what we were trying to get to was the, the three legged stool in um, the explanation statement. Natural resources, probably if we said natural resources, that then helps to encompass air, land, and water mm -hmm. rather than yeah. just working lands. Um, that was part of the conversation with our staff. Um, I think the regulatory piece, piece that's the protection, you know, we like to say we do it through compliance because in adding the how to that, um, but do we capture enough of, of that regulatory piece in the state in the statement today. Um, those are some things I think we could use some more feedback or hopefully that helps you with context around some of the thinking and the history. Dr. Boy. So are we we're giving comments on this now or just yeah, okay. I think this is the opportunity for us to provide any feedback okay. to the team that they can use that in addition to everything else that you've received to is that is that the case Jonathan chair Miller Barbara boy we, I mean we will certainly take feedback right now I also understand that like I mean this is a lot to take in to look at to like I mean to to synthesize language it, it, it take I mean I it seems like it's a simple statement right but I get like it takes a lot of kind of brain power to get to get to the final product um, and so as you're thinking about it I just wanted to frame up in that context right that's kind of how we were looking at the statement you know even as we're you know as we're walking around or doing things right if you if you know if something comes to you um, certainly you know please let us know right this is again we're we're working on until the end of May deadline um, to really be able to to finalize it so um, in the statement underneath protect, promote, prosper. I so it seems narrowing when it says safeguarding Oregon's diverse communities. That seems to kind of narrow it. I feel like um, safeguarding Oregon's diversity. Because I think about our weather, I think about our soils, I think about I mean, I think we're just so diverse. It's not just within the communities. It's more than that. It's just something that came to mind as I was reading kind of seemed to when I when I read communities it kind of narrowed it for me. And uh, Elon Miller for the record, um, I like the natural resources. Uh, because it does then encompass uh, a broader focus uh, from you know that perspective too. I actually really like compliance. Um, <laughs> my old hats that might not sound right for me, but <laughs> but but I really I really like the word compliance because that's necessary to basically deal with regulation ultimately. Um, and if we need that heavier hammer in the 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 in the mission statement, great. But I think I think ODA is unique um, because we we I think get far more regulatory um alignment because we focus on compliance so and again that promotion of food and ag is i think director or said and i had mentioned too it's let's just make sure we're comprehensive and and i would agree including you know governor legislature everybody that where we need we need to have agriculture have the voice. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, Chair Miller. Uh, Miguel Lopez for the record. So, Jonathan, in regards to compliance, and thank you for bringing that up, Chair. Miller, um, how are we doing with our inclusion on multiple languages across the state? So, part of being compliant is being able to read and understand what you're signing up for. <laughs> Chair Miller, uh, Miguel Lopez, that's that's good question, um, and. I'd say, and in, in, um, Andrea Cantu-Shomez can come up and correct anything that you know I, I misspoke around, but um, the concerted effort to translate 
you know, as many documents as we can right, with the goal of, of all of the documents, right, that are public facing into English and Spanish um, as the two primary languages, right, is is an objective that we've been working on um, and that we're putting into kind of, you know, trying to embed in all of our programs, all of our communication out there. Uh, the other piece is that is that, you know, when folks call us, we have um, contracted services to be able to either translate in real time, you know, on the phone or to be able to kind of bring in those in those translation services to to try to mitigate those language barriers. Because, again, to your point, um, you know, that shouldn't be what is providing a, a compliance issue. Right. The, the the lack that gap of understanding is 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 not is not is not a compliance right piece of it. Um, and and so that's on us and it's it's a lot of you know trying to figure out the resources you know where to how to dedicate them you know in terms of being able to to provide that in the most meaningful manner um, but then also looking at you know our, I know our food safety folks did this um, and this is a number of years ago and we've you know we've asked for some resources to to really dig into it and try to figure out how to do it internally but um, you know, really looking around our, you know, within our food safety program too, right? Where's, where are the compliance efforts in terms of, you know, again, in that miscommunication, you know, maybe not miscommunication, but, you know, aligning the understandings and aligning the know-hows, right, with with our food safety standards with folks out preparing food, right? Um, taking that kind of forensic analysis, you know, within our, within our programs, but then also providing that um, opportunity forward. So, um, you know, if you want, if you want more details than that, we can work to get you kind of more statistical details, but in a broad spectrum, that's kind of, that's where we're at in, in pushing that, those services. Awesome. Thank you. Yep, that's all I need. And I would say, oh, okay. Go ahead. I would just, uh, with, you know, with the chair's permission here, um, you know, when the time that we have left, about 15 minutes. Um, you know, we don't have to keep talking just for the sake of talking, but um, looking at looking at those smart goals, right? Kind of, you know, in in the quick reaction and in, in everything that we've talked about, um, you know, not only are those are those the right goals because I, you know I I think that um, you know there's a lot underneath of each one of them, um, but are we really have we captured everything that maybe you know was at the forefront of of your thought process but then also you know is there anything you know a smaller objective or those types of things that that maybe you're like oh i thought we would see this or as you're thinking through it um you know those pieces i get it's a lot of internal um efforts and so there's, there's a little bit of a, an advantage from our perspective right of knowing those kinds of of, of routines and perspective but i'm just kind of curious with the time we have left um any thought process around you know the smart smart goals and the outcomes because again this is where this is where the next step of development is really going to take place um and so making sure that we're we have we have a good enough maybe rooting and feedback there Well, Elon Miller, for the record, um, I I love the operational excellence and uh, the agency modernization is obviously something that we've been kind of talking about and really needing to look at. Um, on the customer focus, um, I'm wondering again back to that promotional piece if something can be weaved in there that uh, because customer focus is also customers, whether the customer be the legislature, the customer be the, you know, the agricultural community, the it, not necessarily in the the widgets of what we do, which I know that's really where you were making sure we're responding and can can do things more efficiently and all that, which is great. But I I do see in the smart goals somehow to weave that other piece in. And I don't know if if I'm just force fitting it there into customer focus because there wasn't another one that really made sense. Well, maybe operational excellence potentially too could be. Uh, yes, Director Henson. Thank you. Um, so in our old strategic plan, we had um, a key objective number six, which was one of my favorites of them was to connect and promote Oregon agriculture. And so that could tie into that customer service piece. And we we talked about it early on in the strategic plan was ag is cool. And that was part of our connection to youth. If some of you, I see Brian's kind of nodding, remembering it. Um, and some of the re refocusing of some of that work in different ways for different audiences. 
And so that that might be a place to think about it. Great. So would be a sub just for my understanding a subset under uh, customer focus. Yeah, I like that. Director Lopez, did you have? Yeah. No, I lost my turn. OK, <laughs> sorry. Director Simonich. Stacy Simonich, member of the board. Um, you know, I, I definitely see these goals, organizational excellence, agency modernization, customer focused surface as um, great ones to have. What gives me a little bit of heart palpitations would be the timeline <laughs> for all three of these happening uh, in a two year, essentially two year time frame, 25 to 27, right? All at once. Um, and I think as you flush out the specific projects under create an action plan, I guess that's probably the next step, right? And so that, that um, how are we gonna get this done and all of this done in two years? That's, that's my only concern, but maybe seeing some of the pro specific projects start uh, end dates, um, yeah, how are we going to get it done? And where will the money come from, right? And there'll be an ask. And what if you don't get all the money and all those things? Anyway, thinking ahead. So, yeah, uh, Chair Miller, Stacy, that's you're right. Um, and and it's it's very resource driven um, to, for for success. However, uh, you know there there are factors that we can control and can't control. Um, and and we will you know we will build this with you know, with the hopes that we're able to augment some additional resources into it, but then also looking at, you know, where can we go within our own means um, and and being able to kind of push push those pieces forward. I would say I uh, agree that I think when you look at these line by line, this looks like a heavy lift. Um, and hopefully what we'll be able to articulate even clearer as we develop that action plan is that these are very intertwined with each other, right? And so advancements in certain parts of these strategies will inherently and hopefully, you know, bring other ones along right side with it. Um, you know, different different pieces are, you know, embedded within, um, you know, especially when you look at any of the modernization pieces, any of the, um, you know, kind of the customer centric services, those are gonna go hand in hand, right? And so I think it's really, it's also um, kind of an anchor point for us to, as we do modernization, be, you know, be able to look back and say, okay, are we building this within a customer centric system, right? Are we, you know, are, how how is this lens that we're applying to it, right? And so they kind of go hand in hand. But again, you know, it's, there, there is a lot here. Um, there's a lot going forward, um, you know, I think that yeah, you know the the next you know the next biennium budget will will drive a lot of the early success around it, um, but you know I think we've really looked at this in terms of you know where can we make the advancements in the next biennium, and then what are the pieces that we're able to going to be able to put front and center for the 27 29 uh, biennium to be able to either continue you know bring over to the finish line, continue in, in great earnest, you know those types of things. So yes two to three year work plan, but again, with some of that adaptability being able to, to push in there. Um, but yeah, good good perspectives and feedback there. All right, unless there are any other any other feedback and, and obviously uh, it sounded like Jonathan, you and your team is open for comments as we proceed, but I think we you want to get them quickly so you will be able to get finalization and, and be on time. And and do you anticipate then at our June board meeting you present this as final then? Chair Miller, members of the board. Or even it's due before, right? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So we will we probably won't take as much time as today, right? Today was the special kind of yeah. really able to dig into it, provide feedback. Um, but we certainly will be you know presenting on the kind of like what the final um, version of that of this is mm -hmm. um, where we go forward. Again, always welcome to feedback, but we're not going to slow down and we're not going to stop. And yeah. so, um, you know, the 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 success of feedback being incorporated is going to be incumbent on timeliness. But you know, we will always continue to have conversations, right? And and, and what makes yeah. sense to feed in will make sense yeah. to to, yeah. to bring in. Would it benefit you any if we were you were to? get a draft to us before you finalized and is that just a more cumbersome another step i don't know if that makes sense or not 
we can once we have well like the mission for example because i think mission is pretty important from a board orientation focus so changes there i, I don't know anyway yeah we can certainly share um once we once we take in substantial feedback and substantive feedback um, and, and we do any revisions, uh, we plan on sharing it back out with staff too. So we can certainly share it back out with the board. The board. OK, great. Would that work? OK, excellent. Good. Yes. Uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa Santa Maria, um, I um, would like to know what is your strategy? What are you doing about the action plan? How are the projects? How, how are you going to give the priority to project one, two or three? And since I'm curious about that. Yeah, Chair, uh, Chair Miller, uh, Lisa, that, that's a, that is the work that starts this week. Um, and so really we wanted to bring in that feedback around um, you know, are these goals the right goals, right? Is all the feedback that drove these goals, you know, kind of in line and consistent? Um, and then that that development of that action plan, you know, those details is what's going to start this week. And that that's a lot of that's a lot of work, right? That's where the that's where it really gets down to it. Um, but that that's really what the month of May is going to be um, is going to be dedicated to, and then finalizing this up. And so, um, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll get we'll get to see it in June, right? And then you'll be able to tell us, well, was this achievable or not? <laughs> yes, Director Hanson. Thank you. Um, I, I might add to it as you think about we're in the middle of our budget development, right? And so our agency budget request and how we focus our asks should tie back to these three things, right? Um, our legislative concepts. As we look at those should tie back to to these three smart goals. So anything we're doing going forward, we need to think about that. That's resource related to tying back to this. And that's how I'm thinking about it. It's that focus on the core. Well, that's about organizational ex excellence and in, and also, you know, agency modernization. We've talked about the challenges we have with some of our IT systems. So I th if that helps you just a little bit more in terms of thinking it, about, the projects. about the projects. Yep, exactly. Director Boyer, I think. So before we depart from this, Something you said during your presentation, it's, I seem to think it was in the beginning and I can't find it in here, but there was a statement saying um, that ODA is tasked with a higher duty. Can you explain that to me? Um, is, it, is it more legislative? Is that where that's kind of heading? I'll take a, a stab at it. I think it's that um, serving all Oregonians piece. It's the bigger mission of the protecting uh, the food safety piece, the consumer protection piece, the natural resource protection piece for everyone. And I, and I see that as the higher duty, the higher calling, the, 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 the social part of, of what we do in it. It's nice. Director Lopez. Yes, for the record, um, Jonathan, it almost begs the question to maybe follow when we present to the legislator at some point, and maybe I'm overthinking this, um, one success story to present <laughs> that encompasses all of these components from beginning to end. So your, your organizational, your agency, and your customer focus, picking something from within the agricultural sector to then point to and say, we've tried to accomplish these goals. Here's an example of something that we have worked on. I almost feel like spoon feeding, lack of better words, seems to be the way to go sometimes. Great. Any other comments? OK, well, seeing none again, Jonathan, thank you for for all the work um, and we're five minutes ahead of time, so we'll get an extra five minutes for the break. I don't think we have quite enough time for the board business in five minutes, but but uh, we'll we'll keep on schedule and we will end up having the public comment uh, period begin at 10.45. Um, and if anybody has not yet signed up or has not noted yet in the um, in the uh, comment box uh, that you're going to be uh, providing some testimony, please do so. So Carla will have that and we can be able to call on you. And particularly in light of the fact that we're talking strategic planning, we 
would love to hear uh, anybody's perspective of what we've been chatting about. So we'll go ahead and reconvene at 1045.
All right, we're going to get started pretty quick here. So if I can have everybody reconvene. All right, we're going to be opening up um, for public comment. And we have one individual who I had a chance to just meet um, who has signed up for public comment, and that's uh, Becky Berger, and she is a farmer uh, not too far from here. Um, yeah, why don't you come up here to the mic so we can have you, you recorded. Well, this was a very spontaneous comment because I was listening to your strategic plan and you invited comments. So I, the only thing I liked uh, I would suggest was that instead of Aggies be agates and add transparency to a core value. Mm. So <laughs> it's my only comment, but thank you. It was a very fascinating uh, strategic plan. Is that going to be open to the public, the strategic plan? Uh, Jonathan, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. The question was, is the strategic plan open to the public? And I would assume yes for ideas and input. So, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. And could you just share with us what you guys farm? Just we farm um, primarily trip type uh, tall fescue grass seed, uh, wheat, hazelnuts, uh, clover, clover seed. And uh, we're from Hillsborough to Amity. We're kind of spread out. We have a seed processing plant in Carleton. Uh, and I, I guess our claim to fame was last year we came in first and second in the nation for dry land wheat yields. So that was Ooh. a nice honor for our farm. So anyway, it's very nice to, to meet wait, you. Wait, wait, excuse me. I didn't get your name. Uh, Becky Berger. OK, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Becky. Appreciate those comments. All right, and we have did Carla. Uh, Lauren Henderson online. Did you want to make public comment or make comments? Uh, no, Carla, I was just signing in. So you had me as joining the meeting. Hi, everyone. Awesome. Hey. Thank you, Lauren. Hey, Lauren, was it just too far a drive? <laughs> no, I know you're holding down the fort, but we, well, we some, miss you. Somebody, yeah, somebody has to stay here. So that's sunny <laughs> and nice today. I'm going to miss the tour, though. I, I'd love to hear your comments on the tour. Well, especially all the work that you put into making this all happen. So great. Good to have you online. All right, um, let's go ahead and move into uh, board business. And I believe that... Uh, are you going to be taking this over? All right. For the board business report for the nominating committee report, Director Santa Maria. Thank you. Uh, Luisa Santa Maria. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, pre pre present a report for the nomina nominating committee. And um, Barbara Boyer and Brian Harper and myself, we met and we would like to recommend Erin Oren for the next vice chair of the board. So we would like to know. Is that in the form of a motion? Yes. OK, is there a second? Second, Brian Harper. OK, it's been moved and seconded. Um, any opposition? No, <laughs> any further discussion? <laughs> Eric, are you willing to uh, take on this? Responsibility. Yes, that would be fine. Thank you. OK, great. Um, no, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Chad is joining. Chad. Hey, Chad, thank you. I hadn't seen you had joined, so appreciate that, Chad. Good. All right. Congratulations, Eric. <laughs> All right, um, we before we would go on a tour, I believe that we may have some just potential spontaneous updates on 
maybe what's going on as far as from our veterinarian? Correct. Uh, yes. A quick update on high path AI from our state vet, Brian Schultz. Can I ask a question first before you come up, Brian? Um, can you give us an update on what's happening with our vacancies on the board? Thank you, um, Lisa Sharple Hansen, director. Uh, so we have two partial vacancies um, that we have recruited for. Um, those the governor's office will take action on hopefully in May. Um, and so cross our fingers that we will have new two new board members for the June meeting, and then we will do another recruitment again in the fall for two more. Um, new board members, we had a significant response in terms of applications coming in this time. I thought you appointed them. I didn't know it was the governor. It's governor. It is governor? Yeah, the governor appoints the board. Oh no, it's commission. I'm sorry. I'm I'm getting confused of which where I am. You are at the Board of Agriculture. <laughs> yeah, but but obviously with strong recommendation from the director of agriculture to the to the governor. <laughs> too many, too many boards and commissions, my dear. Okay. All right. So could we have our state veterinarian uh, please come up and give us a an update on a very tough topic we're dealing with. Yeah, good morning, Ryan Scholes. I'm the state veterinarian for the Department of Agriculture. So um, I was asked to give a quick update, which for those that know me is going to be difficult. Um, <clears throat> so over the last couple months, we have um, in early February, we started hearing out of the Panhandle of Texas that there was some sort of mysterious syndrome going on affecting dairy cattle, predominantly second and third lactation cattle, predominantly in the mid lactation phase. So at the highest, the peak of their production cycle. Um, what we were hearing was at a herd level, we were seeing reduced milk production, reduced feed intake, and then at an individual cow level, anywhere from about two to 10% of the, the milking herd was being clinically affected where we would see them go completely almost almost completely off of feed, almost completely out of milk production. Um, and what milk was being produced had a significant change in consistency. It was yellowish in color, thickened, almost looked like colostrum. That was going on for a while. Texas has some unique peculiarities in how their state, the authorities of their state veterinarian. Um, and so it took a while for them to be able to get, it, get involved. Um, USDA got involved in late March. And on March 25th, the USDA announced that they had um, detected the um, H5N1 highly pathogenic avian influenza virus in milk samples from three farms and a fourth farm they had found it in nasal swabs. So two farms from Texas, two farms from Kansas initially. Um, we also know that there were there were farms in, in Texas, Kansas, and in um, New Mexico that were all being described as being affected with this syndrome. So it's been a little over a month now since that happened. Um, as of last Friday, we are up to 34 farms in nine states. They, we just added Colorado on Friday. So anyone who may have, have listened to me talk last week when I said 33 and eight, we got a new one on Friday. Um, so that was Colorado was just added. Um, so right now, Texas, New Mexico, Kansas, Ohio, Michigan, North Carolina, South Dakota, and Idaho. Um, Almost all of those cases have been associated either with that cluster that was originally happening down in the south and then um, trans transportation of lactating cows from Texas up to the, the dairies in those other states. Um, that started to break down a little bit recently, though, because we are starting to see cases pop up. I know Idaho's second case that they announced about a week ago had no connection to Texas. Um, it was in the same area as their first case. Um, but what we've what we have learned up to this point and what we have learned changes on an almost daily basis. Um, and so I, I always try to caveat this with this is what we know today. Um, there seems to be a connection to the milk. It this seems the virus seems to be acting almost like a like a mastitis, like a, a contagious mastitis in these cows. The early work that was being done, they were seeing the virus almost exclusively in these cows in the mammary glands and the associated lymph nodes and mammary tissue. Um, the milk 
when it's tested, it has extremely high levels of virus. Um, in many cases, higher levels of virus than we see in chickens that have died from the virus. Um, very, very high levels. It has very little clinical effect on the cows. Um, in some of these more recent cases, we're seeing very, very few cows affected. I know the, the first Idaho case is probably the one that I know the most about, but they had eight clinical cows on that dairy. Um, that's a 15,000 cow dairy. Um, so that is, I've done the math, I think it's 0.05%. Uh, way below what we're seeing. And, and so what we're, what we're starting to see, most of those early dairies were very large dairies associated with movement of lactating um, springers. So they, they weren't technically springers at that time because they, they had already calved, but um, 30 to 60 day fresh first, first lactation cows as replacement cows into those herds. Um, that's not something we see in a lot of smaller dairies. Um, and so we haven't seen cases associated with those, but what we've started seeing is some of these cases we're starting to pick up now aren't matching that same clinical syndrome. It's fewer clinical cows. Um, a lot of work has gone into the science on this. One of the issues we have those, um, the H5N1 virus, any highly pathogenic, even influenza viruses are select agents. They are a known bio bioterrorism agent. And so Homeland Security and the FBI tend to frown upon research being done to try and figure out how to get those viruses into species they're not supposed to be in. The science says they're not supposed to be on cows. And so the research has been a little bit slow to start coming because it was illegal to do that research. Um, and so we're we're now starting to see those federal waivers come in, some of the researchers be able to start doing this research. Um, but even things as simple, that seem as simple as, does pasteurization kill the virus or inactivate the virus in milk? The science says yes. The science says we know that an egg product, where, which has been studied heavily, at a lower temperature than what we use in milk, we know it inactivates the virus. No one ever thought we needed to, to check for a chicken virus and whether pasteurizing milk kills it, because no one ever thought that we were gonna see this virus in, in milk. The problem though is this virus has to be, can only be studied in a biosafety level three lab. So the biosafety level of labs is, is a, a scale of one to four. One is your standard lab. Um, four is like Ebola level contagions, um, fully contained suits. There's only one of those that works on animals in the country. Um, BSL three is a one-way door. Everything goes in, nothing comes back out. Um, there are no BSL-3 labs in this country that do milk work. Um, all of the milk work is generally done in BSL-1 or BSL-2. So the FDA literally had to find a lab that had physical space for a pasteurization setup, go buy a pasteurization, a, a high temp, short time pasteurizer, and install it in the lab. Um, where, as you can imagine, in BSL-3 lab, where it's a shower in, shower out setting, even just getting like the employee, the people in there, you know, who are trained to be in a BSL-3 level lab to do the installation, to do all that. It, it just takes time. So we're starting to see those results come out now. Last week, FDA did publish some, um, a, an update on some very preliminary data that showed that, it, that the pasteurization wor is working. They, um, they used retail samples. Um, the first level, the first series of tests they went through, which some information was leaked ahead of of the announcement early in the week was just showing PCR testing on retail samples. About 20% of those across the country had fragments of virus in it. Um, that's not active virus. That's just fragments. And so that indicates that for one, this virus is probably more widespread than we know. Um, but the second phase of that is you take those, um, those samples that test positive on PCR and you set them up in a virus isolation test, basically trying to culture them in a cell culture. Um, and the preliminary results on those FDA released on Friday that that none of those samples had any active virus. So pasteurization works. We know that. Unfortunately, we also now know that this is probably in more than 34 herds across the country. Um, and so last Wednesday, we saw USDA issue a federal movement order. It's the first time that's happened since 2014, at least. Um, but what that order is requiring is that now any lactating dairy cattle being moved interstate have to be tested prior to movement. Um, throughout the rest of last week and even over the weekend, we got some additional clarifications on that. They are exempting movements directly to slaughter, and they are exempting movements to an intrastate market, livestock market, and then on to slaughter. So a cow in Oregon can go to a market in Oregon and then be sold and go to a, to slaughter in Idaho, California, Washington without testing. Um, 
we're still wait, awaiting some additional details on that. Luckily, we don't tend to move a lot of lactating cattle out of this state other than for slaughter or for exhibition purposes. And so the impact hopefully will be somewhat minimal on, on our, our dairy producers here in Oregon. We're working really hard on trying to come up with resources of how to certify. So the other part thing that this, this order did was it laid a lot of stuff on the state vets. It said that you have to, it has to be tested by a licensed or accredited veterinarian or a state certified tester. Well, we don't have state certified testers. We don't have a program. This is a disease that's existed for a month. Um, and so we're working really hard right now to try and come up with some training, um, come up with a way to certify testers on farm so that the employees on these farms who are the ones that are milking them and quite frankly, probably way more skilled at getting milk out of that cow than I am, um, that they can collect those samples and submit those to the lab in concert with their veterinarian. But that we're, you know, we have, you look at the Tillamook area, we have basically three vets that that cover all those farms. There is no way that those vets can add that kind of workload onto their onto their plates. And so that's what we're really focusing this week on is trying to get that up and going. The goal is to have that by the end of the week. Um, my video production skills are not that good, so it's going to be we're, we're going to kind of shoe nail it together for this week to make sure we get something out. We'll work on something that looks halfway decent next week, um, but we want to make sure we get those out the door and get those to our producers. At this point, we don't have any cases in Oregon. We don't expect that we have we don't have any reason to believe that there are any infected herds in Oregon. We're also working really hard on the other side of that, though, of work, figuring out what we're going to do. If we have a case, um, you know, again, this is a disease in a in a species that's we've known about for almost exactly one month. Um, you know, when we had our first case of even influenza in poultry, we had had almost 20 years of of preparations for that. Um, this is a very it's same disease, very different syndrome. It doesn't kill these animals. Um, it does not the the cattle recover in two to three weeks. So the response is not euthanasia. The response is quarantine and recover. Um, we will allow, be able to allow milk to go to pasteurization still, um, and we will, we're will. we still working on the mechanisms to be able to allow uh, management movements to still happen. So the, the day old calves that go to a calf rearing farm, the, the coal cows that have to go to, you know, have to be moved, those kind of things. We're working on that framework of how to accomplish that. One of the, the struggles we have, though, is we don't have slaughter in this state, and so we have to make partnerships with our neighboring states to be able to allow that. Um, but we are working on that. The other piece of our response is working really closely with public health to make sure that they understand the differences in this disease versus how we've been working with them in poultry and make sure that that they can, you know, in poultry, they do a they they monitor ten anyone, any people that are exposed for ten days after the last exposure. And in poultry, that's basically the day we diagnose this is the last day they are exposed. In cattle, it's going to be thirty days plus. While they're under quarantine, that they have to find ways to man to monitor people. Um, it's a it's a passive monitoring. They provide a bunch of outreach up front, and then the the plan right now they're working through is having a point of contact with the farm that they check in with once a day, and then the farm kind of works with their with the employees so that you're not having um, public health people on farm constantly. So the the one last piece that I'll throw in is the other piece we're doing is working on plans to distribute PPE in the case of a of a case um, that's a you know we we have have been lucky enough to inherit a lot of surplus COVID PPE um, and so we have a stockpile of that that if we have a farm that is infected just as we've done with our poultry cases we will provide all the PPE that's necessary to get them through that time. Great Dr. Schultz thank you and it, any questions obviously this has been a, a very fast paced fast moving issue and it sounds like we're in in good shape as far as we can be at this moment um, in Oregon and uh, and uh, the news on pasteurization is obviously fantastic yeah. news so okay director Boyer uh, and one question, and then I want to ask Chad if he has anything he'd like to yeah. add uh, about what you're doing at your dairy. But first, um, so we don't have slaughter in this state? Very, very limited. Um, in terms of coal cows particularly, we used to have one down out in Veneta. Um, they closed, it's probably been six or seven years ago now that Bartels closed. Um, you know, beyond that, in terms of cattle, our largest plants probably killed. 10 head a day. We have very small, it's it's a very small. And so when you're looking, and most of those are not coal cows um, and are not a mark, you know, they're a they're a fairly limited direct 
direct by market generally. Okay, and you have something you want to add, Director Hansen? Yeah. Um, for the record, Lisa Sharplow, Hanson Director. I think that's part of the reason the state meat inspection program that's been such an initiative is so important to Oregon is because we have such limited uh, processing yeah. available to us. Good point. Um, and you say you don't have uh, video skills, but you're using it to get the message out. I listened to his, he had an all staff uh, meeting last week. How many staff were on there? 40? Uh, I think we were close to 100 actually. Really? Oh yeah, my. We did so we did a webinar with all all of the field staff within the agency because we know that I've got a small team that that knows about this, but there's a lot of field staff that interact with livestock producers. So we wanted to get them. We did a webinar with vets on Thursday and then we did a public producer one on Friday that I will share that link with you as well okay. one, as soon as we we're working right now on getting it on up onto YouTube so we can share that one widely. Yeah. So. Great utilization. So and the questions were amazing from staff. So it was really eye opening to listen to that. Thank you. Yeah. And then Chad, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, the only thing I'd add is, is uh, you know, with the ODFA, we've been putting out a lot of uh, information to all the producers. The webinar that went on yesterday uh, was given to everybody. Um, also, my local veterinarian that I use, she she uh, sent that to me also. And so I think all the producers are keeping up to speed on on what's going on um, with, this, with this new federal uh, removing the lactating cattle. Um, and it's just now gone into effect. So I know our cooperative here is is, uh, is keeping their eye on it uh, and may be potentially looking at, I can't speak for them, but I, I think they might be looking at getting some tests so they have testing on hand uh, if somebody's wanting that or, or whether they want to randomly check, check some out on their own. So um, we're certainly keeping up to speed with all the new information as it unfolds and and uh, there's been some other information going out to producers on how to limit uh, traffic in and out and, and these kinds of things with people uh, and also uh, related activities. So um, we're getting a lot of information out there. Excellent. Thank you, Chad, for that. Um, and uh, Director Henson, do you have maybe something to add as closure here? Yeah, I just I want to uh, commend Dr. Schultz and his staff for their work on this issue. Um, they've been involved from the beginning and he has done an amazing job in terms of outreach and working with uh, the agricultural organizations, getting the word out to producers, you know, keeping us updated and then following it at a national level. And so I just appreciate his ability to communicate and use the tools that we have to touch as many people as as possible so that we're prepared. Excellent. Very, very good job. Thank you for that. That important report. Yeah, appreciate you. That. Great. Um, before we adjourn, um, we we do have, and we're going to be going on a tour of this amazing facility after we've adjourned. But um, Carla, is there any news on our next meeting? Is actually first week in June, right? And uh, so, uh, any news on where yet? in Southeast Oregon? <laughs> uh, it is where um, the next meeting will be June four, five, six, I believe. Um, and we are narrowing in on uh, Burns. Hope to have the location at the uh, fairgrounds there and I'm working on the rest of those details and the agenda and we'll have that out shortly. I'll just add that um, when I send the email out about uh, hotel reservations and things like that, especially for the June meeting and the September meeting, um, because we're going to be in Pendleton in September, I do need to lock those reservations in. So I'd appreciate a, a response as to whether you will be joining in person and if you'll need hotel rooms. Great, that, that's a great reminder. And I think too, we had for a, a follow-up for agenda items for our June meeting, we're going to be focusing quite a bit on land use. I think for the June meeting, am I correct? And water related issues. And water related issues. So and for the, the tour of, sorry, and the tour of the uh, experiment station in Burns. Okay. 
so in light of that too, that's also a, a message out to folks who are online that uh, those are some subjects that we're going to be be focusing on at, at that time. And did you need anything more from us, uh, Carla, on um, you know reports, your quarterly or end of year, and you've got everything you need for that? Okay, great, good. Can you give me the dates of the September, please? Ten, eleven, twelve. Thank you. Yeah, and so that goes through Thursday, Tuesday. When is Tuesday? Wednesday, Thursday. Tuesday evening would be work groups. Yeah. Wednesday meeting, Thursday morning meeting. Okay, great. Okay. Unless there's any other questions or comments by members of the board. Um, I will um, adjourn this meeting and we will, uh, there are some pictures, folks, you should have gotten in your email of when some photos are going to be taken and we're going to be heading out on the tour. So thanks everybody for joining us. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>